world that I'm becoming the person to carry the sins of the world. It was a profound moment. 1 Corinthians 5.21 says this. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It was a profound moment. I believe it was the first step of Jesus going to the cross. It was that point where he said, I'm going to carry the sins of the world. I like that verse in Corinthians. It says, God made him be sin who had no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. It also says that it was the fulfillment of, uh, of all righteousness. As we look in Isaiah, we see this fulfillment. Isaiah writes, My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So Jesus makes this proclamation. Even though the world didn't see it at that time, we see it now. This proclamation that I am going to identify with fallen humanity. And I believe God the Father could no longer contain himself. In Matthew 3.16 it says this, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. When Jesus made this proclamation, this decision to identify with us, I believe God could no longer contain himself. God the Father. He opened up the heavens. The Holy Spirit came down and lighted upon him. And God the Father made the proclamation, This is my beloved Son. In Him I am well pleased. The whole Trinity was involved in this. We have God the Father making the proclamation. We have God the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove. And we have God the Son, the one being baptized, the one identifying with humanity. Jesus identified with us. And now His call for us is to identify with Him. He identified with sinful humanity that we might identify with the righteousness of God. I think we got the best deal in this, don't you? He had to identify with sinful humanity. We get to identify with the righteousness of God. Which takes us to our next point, our baptism. When we are baptized, we identify with Jesus Christ. Acts 2 says this, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus identified with us. And now, as we enter into this simple act of baptism, we identify with Christ Jesus. It's a simple act, but it has profound consequences. There's a story about Abraham Lincoln. And during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was in great turmoil as obviously the president during this very difficult time in our nation. He'd often go to church. He'd go to this Presbyterian church in Washington, D.C. And one time he went with his aide. And he would always sit in the back towards the side because he didn't want to disrupt the service with people turning around and looking at him. And so he sat in the corner sort of in the back. And he would put his stove hat, stove pipe hat in his lap and he would sit there and then one day the pastor came up and he preached the sermon and as he was on his way out his aide asked him what did you think of the sermon Mr. President and Abraham Lincoln said well it was extremely well thought out and it was delivered with great eloquence and so his aide said so you thought it was a great sermon and Abraham Lincoln says no the sermon was a failure and so the aide said, well, how is it that it was well thought out and eloquently delivered? How was it a failure? And he said, because the pastor didn't challenge us to do something great. Well, I think in baptism, even though it's a simple, humble act of getting wet, I think we're telling the world we want to do something great with our lives. Maybe it's not great from worldly standards. Maybe we'll never be famous. But there's nothing greater in life than to follow Jesus Christ and to put him first in your life. 
when we submit to baptism and we identify to Christ, we're telling ourselves and we're telling God, we're telling the world, we're telling the devil, I want to do something great with my life. Not by worldly standards, but by God's standards. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And no matter who you are or where you're at or what your life is about, there is nothing greater in life than making that decision to follow Christ. And B, I identify with Jesus Christ, I identify with His death and with His resurrection, which is your next point in your outline. I encourage you to watch this video, please. Today, I tell my friends, my family, the world, that the old Adam, the old Jimmy, the old Crystal is dead. I have been buried with Christ. My sin is gone, nailed to the cross, and paid for by the blood of my Savior, of my Jesus. Today, I declare that my God's relentless, unfailing grace, I am forgiven. I am free. I am me. Apostle Paul says this. He says, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. When I put my faith in Christ Jesus, my life changes. It changes from the very deep, deepest parts of who I am. And the Bible has many different phrases and many different sayings for that. To be born again, to be born above, to... Uh, born of the Spirit to new birth. But here Paul, he takes that event that happens in us and he talks about it in the terms of baptism. He said, just as Christ was crucified, <coughs> that when I go under the water, that symbolizes the fact that the old Bob died. And some of you know that, I'm not my story, but the old Bob was pretty bad. I was a pretty bad guy. But the old Bob died. And when, I, and when coming up is that resurrection to a new life. The new life of following Christ. A new life of faith. A new life of joy. A new life of knowing that my life has purpose. A new life of even though things may not be going exactly as they should all the time. I have that assurance that God is working His purposes in my life. I have security that God is with me. And ultimately, I have that understanding and that knowledge that I have life eternal. That I will spend eternity in the presence of a loving God. I heard one person say that baptism is like a wedding ring. It symbolizes a new part of your life, a new life. The one time you were single, you get married, Put on the wedding ring. I feel kind of awkward. I don't wear a wedding ring because it makes my fingers swell up. But uh, <laughs> I meant to bring it. Uh, <laughs> it's like a wedding ring. It signifies the new life that we have. Baptism signifies this new life that we have in Christ Jesus as we put our faith in Him. And I live a new life. See, and finally, I identify with other believers. As I experience the acceptance of God, it's overwhelming. God accepts us as we are. God accepts us where we are. And this ground of acceptance is certainly not an end in itself. But this ground of acceptance is that place where I can have the courage to change my life. To become something new. To become something different. 
In the ancient world, the idea of equality was, was really unheard of. The very fabric of society was, was these differences. Society was, was, uh, was based on, on differences in, in, in social classes and so forth. And to, to say that there was equality among people would have been an odd, as odd to an ancient person as driving a car down Corinth in the year 48 AD. It was just not on the radar screen. But all of a sudden, there comes this rabble-rousing, troublemaking apostle by the name of Paul. And Paul had this incredible vision for humanity. He had this vision that even though in society, as he's writing to Corinth, I'll read the verse here a little bit, probably there were only maybe a couple of hundred Christians in a city of several hundred thousand, that in God's kingdom, in God's world, that in Christ Jesus, everyone was equal. This is what he writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. So Paul takes the sharpest divisions in the ancient world, and he annihilates them in Christ Jesus. He talks about the Jews and the Gentiles. That was oil and water right there. He says there is no difference. There are one. In Galatians, he talks about male and female, a very sharp division in the ancient world. He talks about Greek and barbarian, a very sharp division in the ancient world. That was the, the social fabric of the ancient society, were these divisions. And then he takes on the greatest division. He says there is no slave and there is no free. Slavery was bound for thousands of years. Slavery was considered a necessity, just the way life was, up until the year about 1800, when there was a man by the name of William Wilberforce, this little, they called him the shrimp that changed the world, this little guy who fought against slavery in England. But Paul, 1800 years before William Wilberforce, he had this vision of humanity that everyone was equal. And there were no differences. And so as we are baptized, as we enter into that, we say that these are my brothers.